Hello and welcome back to our study in the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verses 155 and 156, which read as follows. Acharitva brahmacharyang alandha yobane dhanang chinna kot konchava jayanti khirna macheva palale Acharitva brahmacharyang aladha yo benedanang Sainti chapati khinava Puranani anuttanang Which means Having not practiced the holy life Having not gained wealth in one's youth One wastes away, or they waste away, like old, like old herons, old herons in a pond with, in a pond where the fish are gone, like old herons in a pond where the fish are gone. That's the first verse. The second verse, having not lived the holy life having not gained wealth in one's youth. And they lie like arrows shot from a bow. Lamenting over the over things over lamenting over things in the past. Lamenting over times gone. Again, this, this chapter is a little bit um, on the negative side, which is important. It's important to talk about these things. Um, and I'll, I'll get into that. I'd like this to actually be a positive experience. This one, I think, is quite positive for us. So the story goes that there was a a young boy and his parents were quite wi quite rich they were in fact so rich that um, they thought that his parents thought to themselves that why would we teach him how to make money why would we t teach him how to live how to work um, there's so much wealth he can never use it all and so they simply instructed him on how to enjoy himself, you know, thinking that his life would be a life of luxury, a life of pleasure. Instructed him in singing and in playing musical instruments, and that was all he received. And there was, um, in the same city, there was a very rich woman about his age, and her parents did likewise. And they spoiled them both. We use the word spoiled. I mean, here it's put quite um, neutrally. It's not spoiled. It's just taught him the things that would be important to him, which is basically nothing. And taught him how to enjoy himself, thinking nothing else could possibly be important, right? And eventually his parents, eventually these two got married, right? So this woman uh, married this treasurer's son or this rich man's son. They got married, and so they had immeasurable wealth, a lot of money. And as a result, they were good friends with the king, and so they would go and wait upon the king. And one day on his way to, the, to see the king, um, he saw this group of, of men by the side of the road, and these guys had, they, they knew that this this guy was really rich, but actually quite naive, and so they thought up a, a plan, a scam. And so they sat by the side of the road when he went by, and they, um, they sat drinking alcohol and enjoying themselves. And he, as he was going by, he saw these men who seemed really happy, and they, they were you know, acting up to, to be 
to, to appear as happy and as joyful and, and talking about the benefits of, the, of what they were drinking. And so he asked them, you know, what are you drinking? He said, we're drinking alcohol. And he said, Is it, it, does it taste good? <laughs> and he said, oh, in this world there's no drink like it. And he said, well then, well then I must have some. And so being the naive man that he was, he had never even heard of alcohol or had any, anything to do with it. And these men gave him some alcohol, first a little and then a little more, until eventually he became, of course, addicted. I mean, perhaps not physically addicted, although that's quite possible as well, but certainly mentally addicted. It, it was, and this was the, this was one of the drugs in, at that time. I mean, even today it's a common drug of choice for a lot of people. He became an alcoholic. But I think part of the reason he became an alcoholic is simply because he was accustomed to enjoying whatever he could get his hands on. When something came that was enjoyable, he had no sense that there might be a problem with getting addicted to it or, or over-indulging in it. So whereas a little bit of alcohol is a bad thing, a lot of alcohol is a terrible thing. And so... Eventually he became an, uh, an alcoholic and, and as a result lost all of his sense of, of moderation, whatever little he had. And whereas before, living an ordinary life, it would have been quite difficult for him to use up all his money as a result of his uh, excessive or his um, extreme state of intoxication. He squandered his money, and he was actually able to waste it away. If you've ever seen, I mean, this is the funny thing about about uh, alcohol. If you've ever been to Las Vegas to the casinos, apparently one of the important things is to ply the customers with alcohol because it makes them lose whatever it is that keeps you from gambling away your your life savings. Likewise, bars. I mean. A bar, it's incredible, the bar tabs that people can rack up. Not just that they will drink alcohol at all, but that they'll pay exorbitant amounts of money for the alcohol. Uh, as a result of being uh, without their general sense of reason. And so he acted in this way, you know, giving money away left, right, center. And of course the people around him were these 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 men who had introduced him to strong drink and they were robbing him blind, didn't even have to go behind his back, they just c convinced him to give away all his money. Eventually he gave away all his money and he had to sell all of his things, or they, he found out that he had no money and he said, well what about my wife, does she have money? And so he had them take, he had his wife give him all of his, her money as well, she had no idea, they had no sense of, of uh, saving the money, and so squandered all of her money as well. Eventually had to sell all of his belongings, his carriages and his fine clothes and his jewelry, and eventually his house. Eventually he was so much in debt that he, had to, he was turned out of his house. And eventually became a beggar, uh, living in the streets of living in the streets of Varanasi, which is usually we're in Savati, but this time we're in Varanasi when the Buddha was dwelling in Isipatana, which is interesting as well because the Buddha didn't spend much time at Isipatana. Anyway. One day the Buddha was walking through the city on alms round and he came upon these two old people begging for food. I uh, saw the, the, the man anyway, and uh, saw him begging for food, and the Buddha stopped and smiled. Again, with a sense of humor of the Buddha. Ananda asked him, Venerable Sir, why are you smiling? And the Buddha said, do you see that man over there? That man used to be one of the richest men in the city. And now, after having squandered all of his 
life savings and all of his wife's life savings, all uh, caused by the indulgence in alcohol. He, uh, well, and his parents' lack of lack of any kind of education or even common sense in terms of how to maintain your wealth is now reduced to poverty and destitution. He has become like a heron in a dried up, a heron in a pond, a heron in a dried up pond. And Buddha says something interesting. He says if he had in his, in his if you want to understand the, con the, the real consequences uh, of what he's done, if in his youth he had uh, invested his money and uh, if he had applied himself to business, he could have been the number one m businessman in the world. He had enough wealth and he had enough intelligence that if he had only applied himself, he could have been the richest man in the city. If he had gone forth, if he had left the home life and become a, a recluse, become a Buddhist monk, he could have become, become an arahant. His wife would have become, become an anagami. That was if when he was young he had done it. And or in his, in his middle years, if he had, if he had applied himself to business, he could have been the number two rich man in the world. Not as good, because he uh, wouldn't have had enough time and enough energy and enough capital. And if he had gone forth, he would have become an anag anagami. And if he had gone forth as an adult, and his wife would have been come, become a sakada, sakadagami. If when he was in his third, sort of the middle-aged, uh, sort of older person's years, the third, the third period of adulthood, whatever that is, if he had applied himself for business, he could have become, well, a very rich man, perhaps the third richest. And if he had, if he had gone forth, he would have become a sakadagami and his wife would have become, become a sotapanna. But now he's nothing. Now he's lost any chance of being wealthy as a layman, as a householder. He's also lost any opportunity to become enlightened. His mind is too corrupt. Perhaps he's got liver disease and his brain has been addled by the alcohol. And so he's, then he spoke the, these two verses about if they haven't led the holy life or and anything in the world, and they're useless on both counts. They're like a heron in, an, in a dried up pond without fish, or they're like an arrow cast from a bow. It's a, quite poetic. When you shoot an arrow off into the forest and it just lies there useless. Something that is cast off, something that is thrown away, gone far from any use, any value. So, again, fairly unpleasant story, a sad story. Of course, the Buddha found it humorous. But again, with the, with the Buddha and with Arahants, it's an expression of the, the great peace and the great joy uh, in having freed oneself from samsara. I mean, this, these, these two people, they're not doomed, they're just stuck, and that's samsara, I mean, this is the way of things. They're going to be reborn again, and they'll have another chance, and they'll keep going. That's the way of the world, there's not anything you can do about it, we can't save everyone. Um, but that's the really the wonderful thing, is that we should, the, 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 this verse gives us cause to be joyful first thing it should do, and it's not the only thing, we're not gloating over those people who are unable to become enlightened. But I think it's important because we often get down on ourselves, you know, 
I give all these talks on mindfulness and insight. And it sounds like to be of any worth, you somehow have to attain some high level of enlightenment. But really, we should all be proud and, and encouraged anyway. Pride is maybe not so good, but be encouraged about ourselves because we've done good things. Even just coming here to listen or even just coming to this YouTube channel and turning on a video, even just coming to Second Life to the Buddha Center thinking, maybe I'll find something of value here. That's an incredibly rare thing and it's an incredibly praiseworthy uh, activity. I mean, it shows some incredible foresight on your part. You might not think that. I mean, it might seem quite insignificant. But we, miss, we, we underestimate the power of this, how, how, how many people would ridicule someone who came to the Buddha Center, how many people would ridicule someone, how many people ridicule me for making these videos, how silly, who is this guy, what is he doing? And those of you who watch, thinking you're all sheep, or you're all wasting your time when you could be living your life to the fullest, carpe diem, eat, drink, and be merry. I say it's a, a rare thing in the world, and the Buddha said as well, but I don't think it takes a Buddha to see how wonderful it is for people to actually incline in a good way. The Buddha said it's of immeasurable benefit to meditate even for a moment. If we have one moment of mindfulness where we're here, where we're present, where we see things as they are, aware of the body, the feelings, the mind, the Dhamma, just one moment is an incredible thing. How much, how much preparation it takes to get to that moment where you're actually mindful. Don't underestimate it. Don't underestimate the power of the mind that's inclined in the right direction. And the second thing, of course, that it has to do is give us a kick in the pants, reminding us that the clock is ticking. As with much in this in this chapter, it's in the old age chapter. It's dealing with the fact that we'll all get old, and if we've done nothing of any benefit by the time we get old, we just waste away, squander this opportunity that we have, we will pay for it. There will be consequences. We'll have wasted this valuable opportunity. So it's not about failing or succeeding. It's about using or wasting. We have this opportunity, are you trying? I mean, much of Buddhism is about trying and failing. There was, uh, I saw something on Facebook that I've seen before, it was, or on Reddit maybe, this uh, wholesome memes uh, subreddit. I, have, I haven't, what is it? I haven't failed. I've just found a thousand ways that didn't work. I think that's that's a good thing. I mean, an important thing, important way of looking at things. Because you only really fail when you stop trying. And trying itself is succeeding. It's an activity that makes you a better person. Much of meditation is about failing. It's about realizing. It's about coming to understand gradually how you're doing everything wrong, how you can't control things, how you aren't in charge. And so much of meditation is just banging your head against the wall until you realize that your ordinary way of approaching things, even meditation, is uh, useless, is harmful. And so don't be discouraged thinking, many people are discouraged thinking, I can't meditate, I'm just not able. I can't focus. I try to meditate, but I can't focus. Well, that, that is a great reason to learn how to meditate. Anyone who says they can't meditate because their mind won't stay still 
is misunderstanding the whole point of meditation. It um, has to be told anyway. That's the reason why you meditate, because you can't focus. You meditate to understand that. You meditate to overcome that. And you meditate to let go of that. You don't meditate to force yourself not to get distracted. You don't meditate because somehow some people are able to find a switch where they turn their mind off. And we want to meditate on the distraction. We want to learn about our distractions. We want to learn about our failures. That's all that's required. We're not quite required to succeed in any way. Succeeding comes from understanding. It's understanding what you're doing wrong. The third thing that this verse tells us, of course, is the importance of good advice, which is why um, we should never take for granted what we've gained from the Buddha's teaching. And we should never um, waste an opportunity. And I'm going to sound like a proselytizing theist when I say this, but waste an opportunity to share the Dhamma with others. I mean, I think it would be fine if Christians and, and oops, sorry, if theists were, if they went about sharing things, let's say other religions went about sharing their religions, if only their religion was true, if it was the truth, it was at all useful. And in fact, some of the things they do share, we could say are useful, so that's okay. But I would be completely on board with, I mean, I'm co I am completely on board. It's not proselytizing or sharing is wrong. Two things. First, if the teachings are wrong, don't share them. Give them up. That's a problem. But second is it means not, doesn't mean pushing the teachings on others. And part of being able to, I think the next set of verses that we're going to learn about, or one is coming up, We'll talk about this in more detail, but an opportunity to share the Dhamma is not, hey, there's someone I think they should learn, let me teach them. An opportunity to share the Dhamma is someone suffering, they're asking you, or they are close enough to you that you're in a position, you fulfill a role as a relative, a friend, a, a companion, you fulfill a role whereby they uh, would and will listen and, and, and make use of things that you have learned. Hey, I heard about this meditation technique. I've been trying it. It really works for me. If you need help, try it. Maybe it works. Someone who's looking or someone who is pleading, is asking, or is open to it, not to convince. It's not about convincing people. If you have to convince someone beyond simply making a, presenting a case, if you have to convince them, then it's not likely to turn out all that well. Take the Buddha's example. For those who were unable to understand, he just smiled. I think that's hard for people to swallow. Smiling at other people's misfortune. Well, what can I say? That's how the Buddha rolls. But take the time to share the Dhamma. Remember, some people like this, these two rich people, if only when they were young, or if the Buddha had caught them earlier, they could have done something, and they could have done something with their lives, with, with just the right, right friendship, the right advice, the right support. Instead, they fell into wrong friendship. And of course, one more thing that this verse teaches us is the evils of bad friends, the evils of alcohol, you know, things like that. Evil, evil, evil. Again, I don't want to sound like, a, like I'm preaching, but I'm not going to argue that alcohol is evil. I know it's bad, bad, bad. 
that's the opposite of being mindful. It does has the opposite effect. It, see, mindfulness is about really experiencing reality. It's about experiencing all of parts of reality. We talk we take alcohol to avoid uh, who we are. You know, I'm the kind of person who gets upset. I'm the kind of person who worries and stresses about everything. Well, I'll just take alcohol and then I won't worry and stress. It's like any drug. It takes you away from your problems rather than helps you deal with them. And as we can see, and as we, we see here, and we see other, other places, and as I've talked about earlier, alcohol is quite special in that it removes your ability to reason. It, it leads you to squander your wealth, leads you to act in terribly embarrassing and unmindful ways. It removes your mindfulness. So, a lot to learn from this fun, rather well, sad, sad story of these two people. Wherever, I, wherever they are now, they are certainly getting, getting a lesson, wherever that may be. So, there's the Dhammapada for today. Thank you all for tuning in.